a good so I will start all over again welcome everyone uh, to our Latin American history seminar and today uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, the book by Cristina Soriano times of revolution uh, before I introduce our guest speakers today. I just want to say a few words uh, about our seminar uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time. Uh, we launched uh, the seminar back in 2013 and uh, <clears throat> we meet um, every Thursday of the term uh, throughout the academic year. So you are very welcome to join us uh, uh, during, during all our sessions. And this is our seventh week of the term and we complete uh, the session of this term uh, uh, next, next week. Uh, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Cristina Soriano and Juan Neves Sariegui, uh, who will be conducting uh, the Tertulia today. And we moved into this format since the beginning uh, of uh, the lockdown, uh, which was, it's allowed us to, to welcome you all uh, from uh, across the Atlantic, uh, in Europe, and, and, and in the America. So it's a great opportunity and it's a great pleasure to see uh, so many good friends uh, from various parts of the world. Uh, Cristina Soriano is Associate Professor of Latin American History at Villanova University in Pennsylvania. And the book that we are going to discuss today, Ties of Revolution, Information, Insurgencies and the Crisis of Colonial Rule in Venezuela was published to the University of New Mexico Press in 2018 and received several prizes. She has published also articles in scholarly journals such as Ethnohistory, the Journal of Atlantic Studies, and Itinerario. And she is co-editing the Cambridge Companion to Latin American Independence. And she's currently a research fellow at the Davis Center for Historical Studies at Princeton. Juan Neves is a DPhil candidate in history and, uh, and an AHRC scholar at the University of Oxford. He was formerly a teaching assistant at the University of Buenos Aires in Argentina and a research assistant at the Faculty of Humanities in Coimbra in Portugal. His doctoral thesis examines the periodical press in the Rio de la Plata in the age of revolutions. So very pleased to have him discussing Cristina's book. He currently co-convenes the Oxford-based seminar series, Political Economy and Culture in Global History, and is a contributor to the AHRC research project, The Hispanic Anglosphere from the 18th to the 20th century. He has published in collaborative volumes in past and present journal and the Rut, 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 sorry, studies in modern history. It's a great pleasure to welcome both Cristina and Juan and, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eduardo, for organizing this and for the presentation. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about uh, Cristina's book, which is this one here, you can see the cover. The full title of the book is Tides of Revolution, Information, Insurgencies, and the Crisis of Colonial Rule in Venezuela. It was published in 2018 by the University of New Mexico Press. So to start our conversation, Cristina, I would like to ask you if you could give a general overview of Tides of Revolution, of its structure and its main arguments. Thank you, Juan. And I just wanted to say thank you for to the Latin American History Seminar at OCFOR for, for inviting me and for giving this opportunity to share my work. And um, so thank you, Juan, for, for your question. Um, perhaps I, I should, I'm trying to think of, you know, where I should start and maybe I could give a brief comment of where this book is coming from. And it basically started as an undergraduate student at the anthropology department in, in Venezuela. I was looking into uh, the history, like the more classical traditional idea of history of books and reading practices in Caracas during the 18th century. And I was precisely looking into um, my main source was a private library. So I looked into <coughs> more than 100 uh, private libraries between in post-mortem inventories between 1770 and 1810. And I was, I was working with those libraries. I basically discovered uh, that the topics of the books that these libraries contain was increasingly and dramatically uh, diversifying as we move towards the end of the 18th century. 
So I basically realized it was a process going on that's a kind of a secularization of knowledge or secularization of private libraries. And that was, in, in my view, it was going hand in hand with an increasing kind of a political tensions in, in Venezuela that are shown basically by the uh, eruption of a slave rebellion in Coro, the conspiracy of La Guaira, the conspiracy of Cariaco, uh, there's a movement in, in Maracaibo that's always been kind of a, a debate. It was really a conspiracy or it was kind of a, just a coarser uh, privateers movement in, in the region. But you can feel an increasing kind of a political social tension in Venezuela. And <coughs> I was trying to connect uh, what was going on on those libraries with what I, was happening in the kind of a political scenario in, in Venezuela. So as I finished that work, when I moved towards my, my PhD uh, program, I had kind of a formulate a different question which has to do with information. What kind of information are people circulate, using and circulating in Venezuela at the end of the 18th century and how this information is connected with these political realities and social tensions that, that as I said, increase during this, this period. And of course, dealing with information is such a kind of a uh, difficult topic because information is everywhere. So. So how do I, I see that? That was one of my, my problems. Like, how do I move myself away from the more classical, traditional views of the history of books and ideas printed in books from information that seems to be something more uh, in the air, that people talk about ideas? And, and this is, you know, with this question, I started uh, looking into uh, Venezuela's uh, political movement. And it was like a mythological um, approach, right? Because it, since information is everywhere, how do you look for it? So I started to look more into how these movements developed. And I saw a connection not only between books and the people, which was not particularly uh, enlightening, but I just realized that people were using other forms of communication. And this is where I found, you know, the use of pamphlets and manuscripts and lending of books, uh, because the most important detail here, which I haven't said, is that there's no printing press in Venezuela until 1808. It's one of the last places to receive royal permission to have a printing press. And it basically arrived with the crisis of the Spanish monarchy in 1808. So that was for me the interesting thing. How is that Venezuela is such a vibrant place, politically speaking, and this is also coming from European travelers who are you know, spending some time in Venezuela, and I'm thinking about precisely Alexander Humboldt, how is it possible that it's such a vibrant place politically, but there's no printing press? So there have to be a different explanation. So this is how, you know, this book explores the circulation of information and the development of these kind of what I call political communities at the end of the uh, colonial rule, but I don't want to use colonial rule because that's kind of a retrospective. So I see that as a crisis of the colonial rule. And it was a temporary crisis because in a way, as we move to the 1800s, there is this new way of uh, ruling that's coming with Guevara Vasconcelos, which is let's try to appease the people. Let's try to bring peace back. And there are eight years of relative peace, but it's a, there's more kind of a colonial state intervention during those times. So that's. That's uh, one of the ideas that I had in the book. So in terms of arguments, I would say that the book makes uh, two or three interventions, I think. One of them is connecting Venezuela with the Atlantic revolutions and understanding the role that, you know, the San Domingue rebellions and the Haitian revolution later had, had in Venezuela. That's a topic that had, I, I think was not enough explored other than the amazing work by Cordoba Bello there was not a lot to talk about, you know, the Haitian Revolution in Venezuela. We always see more the idea that the French Revolution was kind of a, a more important force in Venezuela. But when we look into the people, the rumors, the ideas that they're talking about, there is a sense that they knew about what was going on in San Domingue, and that represents an important idea for, for the people in Venezuela, an important um, uh, tide, right? That's why I use the word tide, because I wanted to make the, the geographical connection with the Caribbean. So, so in that sense, this book is trying to contribute to what I think is, is a movement that's been going in the last 20 years, which is integrating Spanish America to the movement of the Atlantic uh, revolutions. That's one, understanding the role that San Domingue rebellions and the crisis in, in Haiti had in the way people use ideas or representations of San Domingue in, in Venezuela. And I wanted to be very clear about that because it's, I don't want to talk about influence and this is something I, I brought with Ada Ferrer and, and Sibyl Fisher's work, it's better to speak about repercussions or 
because it's it's just it's it's less when you talk about influence you're trying to see how idea A ended up being in Venezuela and that's not my 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 purpose my purpose was to understand how people kind of uh, put their own ideas of what was going on in their country into how they saw San Domingue or Haiti or in this case also the French Revolution. So that would be one, one intervention of the book, trying to find the Caribbean connections of Venezuela with, with the Caribbean. And also because that's a legacy of the kind of a more national uh, historiography that tries to connect Venezuela with South America and that entailed disconnecting it with the Caribbean. So I wanted to see that as a, as a whole. And the other intervention have to do with this uh, more interesting and still very debated field of public sphere, right? And, and in the last 20 years, people have been questioning how we understand public sphere. If it's, a, it's kind of a wish we can have, we can make a less normative use of the idea of public sphere. We can talk about public sphere without printing press. If we can talk about public sphere without a bourgeoisie. If we can talk about a public sphere without a coffee shop, how, how do we deal with that. And in this, I have to say, this is not originally my idea. I have been inspired by the work of many people, especially in, in Latin America. And I think Victor Uri Uran is here. His work has been uh, uh, interesting, important to realize this. Claudia Laura Rosas, um, Jorge Canizares Guerra have been talking about the idea that maybe there is an incipient public sphere coming in Spanish American uh, during the last decades of the 18th century. And then of course it would be reinforced and it would basically explode with the, with the um, independence wars, but we can still pay attention to what's going on before. So that would be, I think my, my second intervention. And the last one I think has to do with how the colonial state and colonial agents reacted to this temporary crisis of political tensions. And uh, we tend to, to talk about fear, the fear of San Domingue, the fear of Haiti. And I think fear is still there but I wanna also to ask what people did with that fear. So in my opinion, the colonial state and the agents reacted in different ways. In one hand, they are of course, increasing repression and vigilance, especially among uh, people of color and enslaved peoples. But there all, there's also a need to listen, to understand where the discontent is coming from and trying to find measures to appease, to bring calmness to, to the uh, to the province of Venezuela. So I see that kind of a two-pronged process that will be, I think, the third intervention of, of this book. Thank you very much. So in, in that exploration of information and, and political communities, uh, the book is also divided in, in two parts, right? The, the first part is about media, exploring, right? The, printing material, manuscripts, and oral networks. And the second part is devoted to three case studies, uh, different types of social conflicts in, in Coro, in La Guaira, and in Maracaibo mm -hmm. all in the 1790s. But what I wanted to move on now is to the issue of sources, because as you said, information as a topic of study is quite elusive, right? It's not a discrete archive of information that one can tap into. And, and also in your book, you, you show the, the wide range of archives that you had to research in order to, to compose the book. So I wanted to ask you, how was that process and that challenge of identifying and analyzing sources or information? Yeah. Thank you, Juan, that, that's a great question. And I think that's yeah one of the most difficult parts of, of this of you know writing this book and, and researching for this book is that idea that information is, is everywhere right and I think here I have to to also wear my anthropological hat because I, I, I study anthropology in Venezuela and then I moved to, to history and and then I realized I mean one of the questions that I had as I studied anthropology is how people use the written word in their everyday life right like we we're not, when we learn to read and write, we, we're not just automatically become literate, just literate people, right? We, we start to kind of play with an interface of being oral, being in an oral realm and moving to the written word and how we exchange that. And even today it's even more clear because we're using Twitter, we're using voice messages. So those two uh, spheres or, or um, uh, kind of uh, dimensions are very, are overlapped. So, so I wanted to precisely look into that. How are people talking about things? In this case, political events, how are they using those events or reinterpreting them? And then how they make that 
circulate, how they transmit their, their ideas. So I usually talk about the, inform the circulation of information and the transmission of ideas or, or knowledge. And um, so methodologically, I had to first put my hands and my eyes on all the uh, expedientes or volumes that had to do with these social movements in particular. Because social movements, even though for those who, of us who, do, who like to do everyday life history, social movements are amazing because they bring to the fore uh, dynamics and situations that are usually hidden in everyday life. So I was like, let's take a look at these movements, particularly Coro. I started with Coro and, and the Conspiracy of La Guaira to see how they talk about the information. Because as you know, many people here probably already know, these two movements have been studied for a long time in the historiography of not only Venezuela, but Latin America. They're pretty well known movements. And the Coro Rebellion is, you know, is, is, is such an important movement in terms of how people imagine it, but also how people uh, memorize it, right? And, um, but my idea was to look at those movements just to see how they talk about information, where the information is coming from, how they circulated, what they wanted to do in that movement, how they use ideas on those movements, right? And as I started to look in there and see how, you know, these people said that to that person, these, I, I learned about the French Revolution because a man was visiting the Hacienda and he talked about the French Revolution and then he talked about how they were, uh, the blacks of Guarico in Haiti are rebelling against the power. So there's this kind of orality of how people talk about, in this case, these saint uh, rebellions. And then in the conspiracy of La Guaira, it was amazing to see how they were making, you know, they were circulating these kind of a manuscripts about you know political ideas that are not necessarily uh, completely uh, fabricated or coming from Spain or France, but they were contextualized in the Caribbean context or in more particularly in the Venezuelan context. And the more I started to look into that, the more these different sources led me to other ones, which was basically this kind of a interest that state colonial state agents had in trying to find out who were talking about what and where. So of course that for me was complicated because it's, it seems like everyone was talking about politics and I was concerned that I might be following into kind of a, a rabbit hole that was following a paranoid state, right? Because that's the idea, the colonial state is paranoid about the circulation of ideas of rumors. So how do I separate that paranoia from the historical analysis? I think that was the most difficult part, I have to say. And, but the thing is that once you start reading the sources and you have read hundreds of documents that are talking about rumors of revolution and how people, you know, it, it, this time there's a Frenchman in this plaza speaking aloud about how he's happy about the, you know, regicide in France. And the next time they're not necessarily concerned about these French unwelcome visitors in Venezuela or their presence in Venezuela, but they're talking about that regular people in the streets are speaking about liberty or freedom or equality. So even within that paranoid discourse that's coming from the state, we can see a change in the kind of concerns they had. So an unoriginal concern on French unwelcome visitors transformed into a concern that people in La Guaira are talking about liberty and equality and they're discussing about how that will look for them or they were talking about the presence of this kind of a one, uh, there's more than 1,000 French Caribbean and French soldiers living in La Guaira between 1793 and 1796. La Guaira had a population of about 70,000 people. Imagine 1,000 of visitors that are basically talking about their traumas and experiences in the French Caribbean kind of a theater of, of revolution. So that had to have an impact on how people perceive, in this case, uh, the reality in, in La Guaira. So, so I think that was, for me, the, so one, in one hand you have the archives and where you find all this information, but also the methodological challenges of dealing with a paranoid state that's trying to reproduce that paranoia in, in the documentation. Thank you. Uh, yes, those, those challenges with, yeah, of, of information, it's, it requires a lot of reading between the lines uh, sometimes. And I wanted to ask you about the wider context in which the events that you study uh, take place, because you're looking at the late 18th century, 
and right, there's, there's an important historiography about the age of Atlantic revolutions that spans from the French Revolution to the North American Revolution, um, the kind of international constitutional movements and all these sorts of things. And I wanted to ask you if, uh, how, how do you, how do these cases and this circulation of ideas in Venezuela, what does that tell us about the role of Spanish America and of course Venezuela more specifically in this wider age of Atlantic revolutions? Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, that, that's a great question. So as I said before, for me, one of the ideas here was to connect Venezuela with, or reconnect, I have to say, reconnect Venezuela with the Caribbean, right? I understand, you know, the influence or the repercussions of this kind of a very uh, turbulent time in, in, in the Caribbean. And of course, I mean, for me, the most immediate example was the case of Cuba. And as, as probably most of you know, I work with Ada Ferrer at New York University and I was highly inspired by, by her work. And she has this wonderful, brilliant book that's called Freedom's Mirror, and it's pretty much about the impact of the Haitian Revolution in Cuba. Uh, in her case, it's very clear that, you know, Cuban, the, the planter elite in Cuba saw the Haitian Revolution as an opportunity to then be, transform Cuba in the next sugar productive place in, in the Caribbean, right? And so there is no hesitation in part of most of Cuban uh, planters to start bringing more slaves into, into Cuba. And that went hand in hand with the Spanish reformist ideas that are not only going into Cuba, but also Puerto Rico, Santo Domingo, and even the island of Trinidad, right? This need that we need to be more um, savvy in the way that we administer resources. We need to, in that kind of a Spanish uh, reformism, there's idea that we have to give a new uh, boost to slavery in to make our you know, Caribbean possessions more profitable and productive. And um, so of course, Venezuela is in the middle of that kind of a situation in which uh, is, um, first of all, Venezuela was always perceived as an open country, país abierto. It was conceived of the key of South America, La Llave de Sur America. So there's this idea that we have to keep, even though it's peripheral, and that's one of the arguments that I make in the book is a, is a kind of a peripheral region. No one is really paying attention to Venezuela, but once the age of revolutions begins, there is a concern to keep Venezuela or to seal Venezuela off from the revolutionary kind of influences, right? So the question for me was like, so what's going on in Venezuela? If, if are they following the kind of a kind of a same Cuba example or there's something different? And what I discovered is that there's something different that in fact, for example, the importation of slaves decreased dramatically during the last decade of the 18th century. They used to usually receive around 1,000, 1, 1, uh, 1,500 slaves uh, per year before that time. And suddenly we have that they only importing 120 slaves. So there's a clear pause or diminishing on the importation of slavery. And there's also a need to maybe keep Venezuela off communications with other uh, Caribbean areas. But at the same time, even though that's the general sense of colonial agents, uh, in Santo Domingo, in Puerto Rico, there is a need to connect more with Venezuela and ask Venezuela uh, for reinforcements, either military reinforcements or provisions in forms of food or goods or cattle. So even though in Venezuela, there's a need to seal the country of the Caribbean, the Caribbean regions are asking for more help and more connection. And, at, and here I include Trinidad as well. So I see Venezuela as a particularly interesting case because here, of course, there, there's fear. And I see that sense of, you know, this fear of the Haitian revolution, but that fear is transformed in a way that colonial agents, and here I'm gonna include Guevara Vasconcelos as being one of, one of the principal uh, actors trying to bring that idea of, of negotiation and um, appeasement with the people in Venezuela. So I see there's a, first of all, this idea that maybe we shouldn't become a slave society the way Cuba is becoming a slave society. And second, maybe we should find ways to deal with this large mixed race population that are also talking about equality or possibilities to have political uh, participation. So they found ways to do that and I was, this is the moment in the research, I always think that historians, we come with an idea that what we're gonna find, but we're always surprised, right? We go to the archives and we go like, this is a surprise. And that was for me, one of the surprises that Venezuela was giving me, not only 
this idea that there's an incipient public sphere that's not depending on the printing press, but also that colonial agents and the colonial state is willing to negotiate, is willing to talk about what's going on in the country and how can we prevent people to um, uh, organize insurrections or rebel against the colonial state. And this would explain royalism in Venezuela. And here I follow Marcela Cheverri, for example, the idea that because people of color, enslaved people, indigenous people felt protected by the state, maybe they were not that quick to join uh, uh, Patriots troops during the independence wars. And my explanation is that, that they're going, for, they were coming out of a period of relative uh, appeasement or negotiation that Guevara Vasconcelos tried to uh, take in place during the last decade of the um, 18th century, uh, 19th century, uh, first decade of the 19th century. So I see that as a, that's how I see Venezuela in a kind of a particular interesting uh, theater, I think within the Atlantic revolutions. And then of course the book, I mean, things will radically change after the independence wars begin. So that's why the book basically stops there. Yes, and my next question is kind of a, a, a double question because I, I would like to, uh, to have a kind of a general idea of how written material and literacy uh, interacted uh, in, in with people in, in colonial society. Things like literary rates and, and this kind of education and all these kind of issues. And why is the relationship between, are you all, all the time are, are looking at kind of the uh, interaction between written and oral cultures? And why do you think that it is important for an understanding of insurgencies uh, and social conflict? What do we gain by looking at these kinds of interactions? Um, were there any innovation in practices of communications and media? And, right, were any radical change that you can see with the mm -hmm. previous early modern period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's a great question, Juan. And I think, that, I mean, that's, that's the question that like make me write the first three chapters as, as you know that the first so the first part of the book as Juan said is called media and I basically focus on three different medias and that was an arbitrary decision you can I could have written like a long one chapter including the three medias right I didn't want to do but I think in terms of writing that was a kind of a best thing to do so I have the first chapter on books and the second chapter on newspapers and um, pamphlets and manuscripts, which were, in my opinion, so important in the case of Venezuela precisely because there's no printing press. And then I have the third uh, chapter on, on rumors. So for me, the most interesting, I mean, this, this attention to different media and, and to the interface between the written and the oral is coming from my original question, what's going on with the, uh, population of color, what's going on with the Pardo population, which as you know, represented more than 45% of the population in Venezuela. So they, they are demographically important. And not only that, they're becoming, as we move to the end of the 18th century, they're also becoming economically important because we have this idea of the Pardos Benemeritos, that's an idea that's coming from Alejandro Gomez, of people who are Pardos who have uh, economic power and they are important participants in society. And of course, as, as we see this society that's divided in by you know, social lines and racial lines, there was a limitation for pardos to be either to either go to public education, go to the university or go to the seminar. They were not legally allowed to enter those places. And that's why we have you know, the cases of Gracias al Sacar, of families of pardos who are rich and they want to buy a Gracias al Sacar in order to allow their sons to enter these educational places, right? And the question for me was like, so if they're, they're not getting into the official ed educational system, how are they learning to, to write and read? Because they are writing and reading, right? And this is where, this is an, another kind of a moment of discovery when I encountered these cases of the barber shops and artisan shops, basically um, shoemakers and barbers who turn their workshops into basically elementary schools in the afternoons and they receive Pardo kids to teach them the basics, very rudimentary knowledge about reading and writing. But that means that they are learning to read and write. And there are two important teachers. Uh, one of them is Simon Rodriguez, 
who is interested in creating this project for Escuela de Pardos, to have Escuela de Pardos. And that's if there's nothing particularly radical in that idea that's coming from directly from Spanish reformism, the idea that we should have an, kind of an artisan uh, body who's literate and they know how to read and write so they can effectively transmit their knowledge to other generations. And if you read, you know, the classical Spanish authors of reformism, they talk about the need to, you know, to for a literate art artisan group. And Simon Rodriguez is pretty much birthing that idea into Venezuela. But when you do that in Venezuela, then you're basically saying that pardos or people of mixed race should have access to literacy, should have access to education. So that was his project. Unfortunately, it was never approved. But when he was describing the state of education in Caracas, he's giving us an ethnographic description of you know, what is happening. And he's the one who says, there are barbers who are teaching to read and write. And there are not appropriate teachers. They shouldn't be doing that, but that's happening. And for me, it was not a coincidence that then a barber shop became a place in La Guaira for political conspiracies and for the planning of a Republican movement like the conspiracy of La Guaira. So I find that in, I find that innovative in the case of Venezuela, but not necessarily radically different. It's just like how organically there are groups, subordinated groups that had a need to be literate and they find a place to do that. And I think that's what I wanted to show that there were places that were not legally created to do that, but they're operating in this case as elementary schools or in the case of the barbershop in La Guaira as a kind of a coffee shop or a pub in terms of, you know, being a semi-public space where ideas are debated and texts are written or, write or read aloud, right? I think that's, that's important. And then for me, it was interesting to see that because of the lack of printing press, Venezuelans have to be very creative in the ways they share the, the books and written materials that they have. So I was very surprised to see, first of all, the, the networks of lending books was inter everyone had a book that's been lent to someone, especially if the book was prohibited, then you have no idea where it is. And there are agents from the Inquisition who are knocking on the doors and asking, I heard, I heard the rumor that you have this book. Can I see it? And then of course, no, I don't have it. I give it to someone else. I don't remember what it is or things like that book is running. So that was a, you know, an idea that it was common to feel that, you know, los libros corren. And, and that for me was interesting because it's showing that because of the lack of printing press, there was a need in part of Venezuelans to connect with the other, to create social networks, to share the written materials. And of course, that comes also with the idea of, you know, transcribing paragraphs from a book and putting it together with other books. I have found in Biblioteca Nacional books that are basically compilations of manuscripts taken from different books and pulled on the same book. So, I, I mean, for me, that's if we think about Roger Chartier's question of who is an author, well, that person who's bringing, you know, pulling paragraphs from different books and, com you know, compiling that in a new book is being an author, is deciding to choose and, you know, kind of a cherry pick what's interesting to, to him or to her and put it together in a book. So that I think is, is interesting. I, I think one of, one of the ideas of, of, that I had when I was working on this is, in a way asking those traditional historians of the books to look, to have a more open idea of what a book is. And especially if we are so attached to the printing that we forget that there are manuscripts books that are important in this library. So, so that's what I wanted to, to do, like diversify how we understand the idea of, of books in this case. Yes, and, and I think that that's something that your book does uh, very well is precisely that, uh, emphasizing that there exists this huge universe of manuscripts that were generally underlooked and the importance that others had. So we have to uh, be more attentive at what happens in society that don't have printing presses or were printing presses or few. Uh, and, and I'm sure we're going to find more things in, in, in the archives. Um, I wanted to look a little bit to the rebellion of Coro in 1795. And you were talking a moment ago about the repercussions of the events in Saint Domingue, and I wanted to ask you uh, what were what are the differences of the repercussions in different social groups and social racial groups 
uh, in, in this revolt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the color rebellion for me is um, uh, kind of a, so, so, such an interesting event, not only because it was, it was important and that there was more than 300 enslaved people who participated in the rebellion, but also because it's been very important still today in the memory of, of Venezuelans and in the memory of Afro uh, Venezuelan communities even today. And I, I just, I'm gonna say hello to Chris Red here, who's uh, an anthropologist who worked with me about political memories of Coro in Venezuela even today. And she's been doing an amazing work on the ethnography of, of Coro. Um, so one of the interesting things about Coro is that there were, there were, there were two discourses, even back then in, in colonial times. So there was a group of people who said, well, Coro, the rebellion of Coro happened basically because there are French revolutionaries ideas circulating everywhere and people basically follow the model of, of France and then Haiti and then they rebel and they, were, they wanted to constitute a republic, a black republic. And that's one extreme. The other extreme is like, no, that's not necessarily what's going on. Uh, they are asking for kind of a different measures. There are discontent because of, there is a raising of the Alcabala taxes. There is kind of a more economic administrative concerns in at the core of the rebellion. And those ideas of, you know, these enslaved people willing to create a republic is part of the paranoia that the state, the colonial state has. So we as historians shouldn't be, a, we, we shouldn't be reproducing these, all those paranoias from, from the colonial state. And um, so when I approached court, I was like, I don't think it's either or, maybe the two things are happening at the same time. Maybe it is true that, you know, what is at the core of the movement is that an, an, an amazing dissatisfaction and discontent for the economic pressure that the new kind of attributes and a new tributary agent who just basically arrived in Coro created among the people, especially those who are uh, transporting goods from the countryside to the city of Coro, which would be the case of, of Jose Leonardo, or even in the case of Jose Leonardo, his wife is enslaved women and he leaves the contrast of being a free man, having enslaved uh, wife and having of course enslaved kids, right? So that's part of the, of the tension. But that doesn't mean that people are not talking about revolutionary ideas, right? Like I was like, if we look into these economic prerogatives and motivations, that doesn't mean that they're not talking about something that's out there in the air as a rumor or humor that has to do with the revolution in, in Haiti and how people perceive Haiti. So for me, saint Domingue had like different um, faces in the case of Coro and depending on you know, which group you belong to, you will see the rebellion of Coro has been an, one expression of saint Domingue or a different expression of saint Domingue. So my main argument in this chapter is that as uh, uh, the first thing that we have to realize is that the most important colonial agent in Coro, who is Ramirez Valderrain, is basically taking justice by his hands. He's not following the legal procedure, the judicial procedure that he was expected to follow in a case of a rebellion. He basically kill everyone he could without following any judicial, without taking testimonies. And he needed to justify that by saying, so you know, this was exactly what happened in San Domingue. So I needed to start it, stop it at the moment, right? So there is a need in part of him. And then it was reproduced by Carbonell to see the rebellion as a kind of a completely kind of a influenced by, by San Domingue saying this, what they wanted to do is basically to create a black republic and he used the word republic. But then when we look into the testimonies of especially white planters who encounter at any moment of, of the uh, process, uh, any either rebels or they helped Valdez, Valdez, Ramirez Valderrain to capture other rebels, they're not necessarily talking about rep a republic, they're talking about vengeance, they're talking about that these enslaved people wanted to revert the social order. They're, they're talking about having a mixed race society. They're talking about keeping the white wives for themselves and reproducing through them so they can have a part of society. They're talking about killing whites. So it's more kind of, it, it, they try to impose kind of a more violent idea among the rebels of Coros. They're not, a republic is something too high for them to think about. They just want to to create a revenge, a social racial revenge against white planters. And then of course, the most difficult thing was to try to capture the voices of those who participated in the rebellion. And I think that's you know, something we all, historians of the color rebellion will always miss. Uh, this uh, incredible important expediente, which was basically the testimony that was taken to Jose Leonardo Chirinos, uh, which is lost and 
there are still people out there dreaming to find that testimony. One day, maybe Krishna, we will find it. But we haven't been able to see what he, how he himself defended. But there was a historian in Venezuela, Arcaya, who was able to, to look at that was the last person to see that testimony. And it, I tried to read his description of Jose Leonardo's testimony between the lines. And it seems like, you know, Jose Leonardo was not necessarily asking either for a black republic or for a completely reversion of the society, but he's, he's talking about negotiation. He's talking about contesting the colonial authorities. He's talking about finding ways to reduce the tribute and using the rebellion as a social manifestation, social protest to push the colonial agents or colonial authorities to kind of meet their demands. So that's a different interpreta interpretation of Saint-Domingue because that also happened in Saint-Domingue. When we look into the French commissioners who went to Saint-Domingue to you know, kind of negotiate with Toussaint, there is negotiation. There was a space that was open to negotiate with ex-slaves or people of color. And that's what I think Jose Leonardo and some of the people accompanying him are trying to reproduce in the case of, of Coro. So I read those three different narratives and the three of them are reproducing or projecting the idea that people had of San Domingue. There was a rumor that I ha unfortunately haven't been able to um, confirm. There was a rumor that apparently Jose Leonardo even traveled to San Domingue. I'm not sure about that. I haven't found any uh, kind of a document confirming that, but there was part of the rumors that circulated in Coro. And that's again, connecting in this case, the leader, the Sambo leader of the Coro rebellion with, with San Domingue. So I think that, you know, that for me was kind of interesting to see, but basically to see how San Domingue could speak in different, with different voices in the case of the Coro rebellion. Um. Now we're moving to, to La Guaira Conspiracy, which took place in 1797. Uh, I would like to ask you if you could expand on this idea of a public sphere without a printing press in the light of this case. Yeah. Thank you, Juan. Yeah, and I've been, I've been cautious to, to say it is a, it's like an incipient public sphere. I don't wanna say that it's a fully public sphere because there are some elements that are missing uh, one of them is the printing press, but also, you know, the idea that the state is intervening or there's an idea of a national uh, community being uh, uh, reproduced or even the connection with the state or if there's a bourgeoisie being part of this. So that's why I, I prefer to talk about an incipient uh, public sphere. And this, this comes not only, again, as I said before, I'm not the first one to talk about the idea that there is an incipient public sphere, you know, emerging in, in Spanish America before the uh, Spanish monarchical crisis. These ideas are coming from Claudia Rosas Lauro in Peru. Uh, Victor Uribe has talked about this. Lehman Johnson have mentioned this in the case of Argentina. Jorge Cañizares Esguerra have talked about the scientific, a science, a Latin American scientific revolution without a uh, public sphere or without printing press. Uh, but I think the person who has really kind of concentrated the most important uh, reflection on public sphere in, in Latin America is Pablo Picato with this wonderful article about, you know, this uh, kind of a historiographical map of the public sphere. So I wanted to bring Venezuela into, into that potential um, uh, historiographical map that, that Pablo Picato is presenting us. And, and for me, it's, it's about understanding that perhaps this incipient, uh, is it, I see it as an incipient public sphere because there are autonomous individuals in La Guaira speaking about matters that are common to the people. Um, but it's also kind of a, a diverse public sphere in terms of kind of a social racial composition. When we look into who, are, who is the people attending or going to the barbershop meetings, who are the people going to private houses to talk about what happened in the barbershop, for example, what kind of uh, you know, uh, meetings they organize are usually when they go to, to walks into the river. And so there, are, there is a space that's, you know, being, that's emerging in the case of La Guaira that's uh, multiracial, multisocial, I mean, meaning that there are people from different social backgrounds and they're talking about political participation. And, and the most, I mean, the moment where it becomes more clear is when we look into the papers that they are sharing. And these are papers mostly written by Picornel, who's, as I mentioned in the book, is a, is a prisoner from the, um, rebellion of San Blas in Madrid, who was sent to La Guaira. And by the way, I think it was the worst place they could have sent him because, I mean, they sent Pricornel to La Guaira and we have 1,000 
French Caribbean soldiers, refugees and soldiers living in La Guay. So if you wanted to send him to a good place for him to basically radicalize people, that was the best place to send him. So talking about, you know, not very good uh, uh, state decisions, right? But he's creating this amazing uh, set of documents that are seen as kind of a political propaganda, selling the idea of why a republic would be a good idea for Spanish America, how Spanish America seems to be the future for Spain, basically for a liberal Spain or bringing some liberal ideas about Spain, but uh, it's definitely creating new spaces for political discussion. And for me, it was quite interesting to see how he's writing in the prison, which by the way, the prison is a very permeable place. Everyone in La Guardia is visiting Picornel, either with the excuse to shave him or with the excuse to cure him. But we have pharmacists, doctors, and Narciso del Valle, who's a barber shop, visiting Picornel and speaking about what's going on in Venezuela. So it's interesting because Picornel seems to be a, a, an actor who's putting things together. And among those things are these manuscripts that are circulating in La Guaira. And then the, the barber shop became a place where people are transcribing those papers and lending those papers. And there are, I mean, I could, to be honest, I couldn't put in the book all the testimonies that I found of people who said that they learned about the conspiracy while visiting the barber shop because it was becoming repetitive. And the editor told me, Christina, it just, we, we got it. There are a lot, there's a lot of people going to the barbershop and learning about the conspiracy. Uh, but there are more testimonies that, that I collected about that. So for me, it was, you know, it was a way to see how there's this innovative, incredible space of circulation of manuscripts and texts, of reading out loud to people, of meeting together to talk about what's going on in La Guaira and why what's going on in La Guaira is reflect of what's going on in the French Caribbean region. And here I talk about the French Caribbean because I, I do think we have to decenter Haiti sometimes and think about also what's happening in the French Windward Islands, what's happening in Guadalupe, Martinique and Granada. And those ideas are also coming to La Guaira because there are people from those areas being uh, transported to La Guaira. So, so for me, this is like a public sphere that's you know, of a place that's in the fringes of the colonial world but it's exposed to the Atlantic Revolution and that's creating that political dynamism. I see it, if I have to talk about characteristics, I see this as a, you know, a public sphere that's departing, is, is creating a colonial space, but it's departing from reformist ideas that's depending on this kind of colonial networks of commercialization and communication. It's not, I mean, La Guaira is an important place in terms of trade and commercialization in Venezuela. Uh, the participants are inspired by ideas of the Spanish reformism, but also bringing about ideas of, you know, French republicanism. And they're also reproducing their own social racial dynamics of Venezuela, particular dynamics of Venezuela in the case of La Guaira. One of the most, for me, exciting examples will be when they talk about La Cancion Americana or the Carmagnola Americana, which is like a translation of a French anthem of republicanism, but they're not talking about the sans culotte anymore. They're talking about the descamisados the shirtless, right? So there are even cases of translation, but this is not literal translation. This is a translation that's taken into consideration the local context. And for me, I have to say the most exciting part of looking at this is that it made me feel that for the first time, or at least in a very tangible way, Venezuelans were able to read manuscripts or written texts that connected directly with their realities. Because they, I mean, they're being, they have been asking for a printing press for at least 20 years and they were rejected several times. There was never provided a reason why that was happening. I think I found a similar case in Cartagena where they basically received a printing press in the, by the 1800s and they couldn't have permission to operate the printing press until 1808, I think, or 1810. Um, so it's a similar case, that fear of spreading revolutionary ideas, kind of a, prevented people from having a printing press, but there's a need to have one precisely to produce texts that are connected with their own realities. And I think that's what the co-conspirators of La Guayras are trying to do, creating texts that connected to the people's realities. And they even try to sophisticate those, those texts. Thank you. And, and I wanted to ask you know, about maybe the other side of the story, right? Of yeah. given given this other dynamic circulation of political texts and ideas, uh, what did the colonial authorities do 
uh, how do they respond to, to this phenomenon? Yeah. Yeah, that's um, kind of a, one of the, um, that's one of the, what I think is one of the arguments of the book is that uh, even though there's a lot of fear and paranoia uh, that will justify repression or increasing repression and vigilance, and that was one of the responses that there was a, all kind of measures that they created. For example, they came with the idea of having um, kind of a, a, a squadrons to kind of a patrol the regions, especially where the plantations were located. They had ideas of creating more police, uh, kind of a police or neighbors who played like a police role in uh, different towns in order to be vigilant about who are sharing and how they're sharing revolutionary ideas. So there's an increase in vigilance and repression. But on the other hand, as I said before, I have found interestingly that there's also a willingness to listen to what's going on in Venezuela, especially among subordinated groups of colors and to try to understand their discontent. And this is something that Guevara Vasconcelos explained very clearly in a letter he wrote around uh, the 1800s. He said that he was called to be the general captain of Venezuela in order to bring peace to the region, to a region that was perceived as being too turbulent. And, um, and he said that during the first year as a governor in Caracas, he invited different people to his dinner table, including pardos and free blacks because he wanted to understand how they perceived the reality. That's something I was not expecting. Again, this was another moment of surprise when I was reading the documents. I had no idea that Guevara Vasconcelos had did such an effort to try to understand what was going on. But he also had different colonial agents that he sent to different places in Venezuela in order to collect the discontent of, of the people. And I found a very interesting case of Agustin de la Torre. He was a, a kind of a official who was sent to places in Venezuela, especially in the Valles de Araguas, that were perceived as places that were where the maroon communities or the self-emancipated societies were growing too fast. So he was called to locate those communities and try to identify what's going on. And it's quite interesting to see that there's no repression in this case. They're approaching these uh, cimarrones or these uh, self-emancipated communities. They're asking them why they run away. What were the reasons that motivated them to run away? What they wanted, how, how can they go back to their previous plantations? And I mean, that's a space of listening that I have never seen before, which is like, I mean, there's a space where they're being listened to, and this is recorded in this incredible report by Agustin de la Torre. And then Agustin de la Torre created um, this amazing document where he's making recommendations on how to appease the general discontent, especially among free blacks and enslaved people in, in the Valles de Aragua. And he's making recommendations like we should give them more meat. They should have more access to better kind of a quality of, of foods or we should control the shopkeepers who are abusing their power over the black population that are coming to, to buy food. Or we should even bring better quality of tobacco from the plains to this area because enslaved people are not happy with the tobacco they're smoking. So those are like, what? How come we have suddenly after the San Domingue rebellion, we have colonial agents willing to bring a better quality tobacco to enslaved people, right? That's, that, that for me was a striking. So, so for me, I see a colonial state that's trying to find or to create an act of balance between keeping the population control, but also keeping them content. And again, that will be a way for me to explain royalism in the case of Venezuela. And there are different places, especially Coro, for example, was a place of, of royalism. And um, because it will, Give, I mean, there are at least eight or 10 years of this relative uh, tense calmness that's happening after the initial, the, the previous decade of conspiracies of, of rebe and rebellions. So, so I see that as a two, I think the colonial state act in, in two ways at the same time, and they're not necessarily contradictory. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious of the time, so I think I will hand over to Eduardo to open the, the discussion to the audience. Thank you very much, uh, Juana and Cristina, for a very fascinating uh, talk on 
uh, the situation in Venezuela uh, just before the revolution, 